We're going to give everybody on Facebook just a moment to find us. And I think we're actually really up on Facebook now. Yes, we are. I always get confused because the Zoom boxes on my computer are different than the ones that televise. So I just realized that I probably make a lot of people confused when I say I'm going to go over here to start. Okay, so good evening, everybody. It is 6.03 p.m. on June 24th, 2021. Almost a year ago today, we held our patient-focused drug development meeting. That was on the 26th. If you haven't seen it, go watch it on YouTube. Um, as we get our friends on Facebook to filter in, I'm going to give a couple of announcements, and then I'm going to hand over the introductions to Dr. Matt Martinez. So we will be filtering our meeting through on Facebook. We will not be accepting questions through the Facebook link. If you would like to join us in the Zoom webinar, you are welcome to do so at the link. You'll just have to register as you come in with your, um, you know, your Zoom account. If you don't have Zoom, you're going to have to download Zoom so that you can join us in Zoom and ask questions. Um, for other housekeeping purposes, towards the end of the presentation, we will stop streaming on Facebook and we will stop recording because that is an opportunity for people to ask questions that they may not want to ask that will live in perpetuity on the internet. So if you have a question that you wanna to hold to the end, you must be in the Zoom room for those questions that will not be recorded. I think I said it all. I'm going to pop up a poll. And as I launch the poll, participants in the Zoom room, you can just answer some questions and let us know where you're from, what your experience with HCM is, and how it is you found us here tonight. And that being said, I am going to turn it over to Matt Martin. Oh, sorry, Matt. Before I do that, Julie's not on camera right now, but I wanna introduce my team to everybody who's watching. Amy Mann is over here in the corner or over there, depending on where you're looking. Uh, our meeting coordinator, without her, we couldn't make all of the logistics happen to make the Big Hearted Warrior Tour happen. And Julie Russo, who's not on camera right now, is our volunteer coordinator. And we're gonna be hearing a lot more from her real soon. And she's going to be helping some of you get logged on this evening. That being said, I will now hand it over to Matt Martinez, who will start the event. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Matt Martinez. I'm one of the co-directors of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Program here at Morris Town Medical Center in Atlantic Health System, along with uh, Dr. Marty Marin, who most of you probably know. Can you see my screen, Lisa? We can, but you're not in present mode. Now you're in present mode. <laughs> All right. So this is going to be a bit of a conversation. What Dr. Marin and I wanted to do was to introduce kind of who we were, what's going on, where it all started, and then talk about what we provide, how we integrate Tufts and, and introduce our team to you, and then get to our questions, which is pretty straightforward. We're going to go through uh, what the guidelines brought to us in 2020 and and talk about it. Marty and I can talk about what happened in the room or at least some of the stuff that happened in the room and, and uh, try and educate us along the way in a free form kind of way. So this all started in 2014 with uh, Bob and Terry Mast with a generous don donation to get this started in the name of their, of their daughter, Shannon T. Mast. And since that time, things have continued to evolve and, and, and explode. And it started as a program um, <clears throat> in the hospital, right next to the valve program. And it is the only hypertrophic cardiomyopathy center of excellence in the state of New Jersey. We happen to be just a few minutes from uh, the HCMA, which keeps us on our toes for sure. Uh, but it also keeps us well connected to all of you and, and, and to what that pulse looks like. And without that, we would never have been able to form this integration with Tufts and really start to build what we expect to be one of the premier centers on the East Coast, uh, along with all of the integration you're gonna hear about tonight. So we know that HCM is common, right? One in 500 people worldwide. We know that we undertreat it, we underdiagnose it, and, and we're still trying to do a better job at that. So if you think about where we're situated in New Jersey, what uh, Dr. Marin sold me on was, man, this is a packed state, a densely populated New Jersey, 
close to New York City, close to Pennsylvania, and in that tri-state, an opportunity to integrate with other centers and really to bring better care to optimal care, to state-of-the-art care to this group uh, in New Jersey and help kind of hold down the fort along with him as he built this program starting back in 2014. There are, as I, as I say, no other centers of excellence in the state. And you know that Morristown Medical Center is well known for its cardiology expertise, whether it's in the state or in the region, internationally, and, and of course, nationally, it continues to add programs of distinction like this one to try and escalate the level of care for, for all of the, the members of the tri-state, but, but clearly for Morris County. So this is our team, and it started mostly with uh, Dr. Marin all the way on the left and, and uh, Dietrich DeBose, who you'll hear from in a little while. And it started as a program of only a couple of days a month. And we, as Bob Mass taught us, taught, uh, told all of us, this would be big and big often and, and continue to grow. And, and it has slowly after a, a short get up and go period, they added Ethan Rowan, who comes down also to provide care from Tufts Medical Center. And then just a couple of years ago, they convinced me that the drive from Pennsylvania was not nearly as long as I thought it was. And uh, I was honored to be a part of this uh, really incredibly growing uh, program. And in 2019 became full-time and our HCM program continues to grow from that really now into a weekly clinic. Right, we started as just a couple of days a month, then a couple of more days a month, and now we're weekly, daily seeing patients um, and continue to evolve. Now providing inpatient care and continued expansion of services, utilizing much of the resources that Morristown already had for us, but to better integrate that with specific HCM care that uh, I've been doing since uh, 2006 when I was a fellow. Uh, at the Mayo Clinic and then stayed on staff and, th and then came east eastward to continue the um, care for HCM patients on the East Coast. So what we're trying to do is, is continue to work with all of the, the great cardiology care that's already being delivered in the state and, and integrate ourselves and provide this level, this high level of care with all of the pieces that go with that, well described to be a center of excellence, really have to be at the top of your game to participate at this level uh, like Tufts does, like Cleveland does, and like Mayo does, we've got to continue to escalate and, and, and strive for that. So Morristown is well known for its imaging. It does uh, over uh, nearly 2000 cardiac MRI on a regular basis, do cardiac CT. And of course the echo lab is led by Linda Gillum, who is really an expert. Uh, one of only a, a handful of women who is a master of the ACC. She is mapped like, uh, like Barry Marin, and um, a, 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 only a small number can deliver that and, and really has developed quite a, an outstanding echo lab that now mirrors the type of collection of data that we'll talk about in a little while that is being done at all the other major, major medical centers. Our stress lab is, um, is robust. That it, it allows for hemodynamic stress imaging, well-described uh, stress echo looking for LVOT obstruction. And now we just added a state-of-the-art CPAT lab that I completely took the blueprints from, from the NFL combine and said, uh, this is what we need. Here, here's the, here's what they have. This is what we have. And thankfully we have a, a grateful donor who has contributed uh, that to us and all in one building on the fourth floor. Uh, MRI is capable. Now stress testing is, is capable so all in one spot, the patient experience continues to improve. Our arrhythmia team, you may know there are uh, a number of folks. Steve Winters is, is not new to this group. He is uh, well re respected in, in, uh, in the Morristown area and certainly with the HCMA. And all of this group helps provide care for us. We have a couple of electrophysiologists who have specific interest in genetic cardiomyopathies like HCM and and their expertise is, uh, is welcomed and we integrate with, with them really on a regular basis. Our trans catheter team, our, our interventional group is, is really internationally recognized that uh, uh, Philippe Genero helps uh, anchor this and is one of the pioneers of trans catheter valve and structural heart programs. There's very little 
that they cannot do. And many novel therapies that are not offered at major medical centers are offered uh, right here in Morristown Medical Center. And they do that with a, a high quality um, product. And again, easy to work with right across the street from where we are now. Now our surgical program, you may know as well. And, and what you don't know is that we were able to add um, Dr. Van Boxtel to that group. Now this is a complicated discussion because HCM surgeons are hard to come by. There are not a lot of expert, uh, of surgeons because this is a different type of surgery than really any other type of cardiac surgery. So not only do you have to be skilled, but you have to like it and you have to want to do it. It's a challenging surgery to deliver. That's why it's not done at most centers. So Dr. Van Boxel did specific training to try and um, gain expertise in HCM and now works, is trying to build that program slowly in collaboration with Tufts and with, with Mayo Clinic. And we clearly have some, some growing to do. And, and our hope is that over time, for those who cannot go to centers with complex uh, HCM care, that we may be able to deliver that same quality for some patients right here in New Jersey. So the pathways for HCM well described, and I'm sure Lisa will talk about this again uh, in the future. We know that many do very well and just need continuity of care. Because although HCM is not the only thing in your life, it does integrate itself into virtually everything you do. It's not unusual for me to get a phone call with my patients having cataract surgery. Are they safe to have that with HCM? Yes, they are. So we're, we, we, we're part of their care as total care. Really, the vision of Bob Mass was to try and deliver that much like it's been done for years with, with the HCMA. Now, in our, in our center, we're able to deliver that locally through Morristown Medical Center. And then, of course, with all the things you just heard about, the arrhythmia care, the surgical program, the interventional program, and the EP program, all of the other pillars or how we care for HCM can all be done in one roof. So we're excited that this is the earlier stages of a full-time, long-term, we hope, program to deliver HCM care right here in Morristown, New Jersey. But what's really exciting is that we now can do more robust research. This is a single trial that we were one of the earlier rollers in. You'll note the date here, January 2020, just shortly before something called COVID shut all of this down internationally. But we hope to continue to deliver research to the and novel therapies to, to, to folks who come to our program. Thankfully, uh, uh, Dr. Rowan is really an expert in um, and helping integrate into their database. The, for those who don't know, Tufts has a very robust database with thousands of patients with multiple data points that we are now linked with separately. All in, there's no, uh, all the PHI is protected. I don't want you to think I'm sorting through the Tufts database to see who's there, but we were able to mirror what Tufts is already doing and then hopefully leverage the power all of those extra patients as we add them for our Morristown group. Much of that data was integrated into the 2020, 2020 guidelines, which we talk, we'll talk about at the end. And then recently, Dr. Rowan and, and, and Marty and, and Barry were able to produce some early data from the collaboration between Tufts and Atlantic Health System to talk about the care for HCM, in this case, for, for disparities. And then what's really near and dear to me the most important thing for me is education. And I'll throw in a shameless plug for the International HCM Summit, really the premier educational tool for, 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 um, for delivery and state-of-the-art care for HCM. And what you've seen in the last year and you're going to see in the next two or three years is a continued focus on HCM. This is a program I was involved with, shining the light onto HCM. If you can see it, you can diagnose it, and then it is a contemporary treatable disease. So we want to identify it. We're trying to help people better identify what it is. This is a, a combined webinar with the ASE in the same manner, just like we did with ACC. And then what you haven't heard about that Dr. Marin's involved in and others uh, as part of the writing group that Dr. Steve Ahmed and I are, are co-chairing is the acceleration of the guidelines. The goal is to get folks more comfortable with the guidelines 
faster than ever before because it takes years and years to integrate guidelines into basic clinical care. And quite honestly, we don't have the time to wait. There's too many opportunities to deliver right now state-of-the-art care. And this is gonna provide educational tools. We've already done a, a hard house round table for not only docs, but for patients to better understand what's, 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 what the patients need. Because we think we may understand what's happening, but nobody has credibility like a patient with HCM and then pr producing those patient resources. What do school nurses need? What do PAs and, and, and athletic trainers need? To, when they hear about this, I have a family history, I have HCM, what does that mean for gym class? What does that mean for routine days? What can they do? What can they not do? We're gonna provide some of those resources to try and make sure that they don't get left out of things that they ought to be able to do very safely. So our program is somewhat new started in 2014, but we crawled for a while. And now with, with Dr. Dr. Marin really lighting the fire on this, we continue to grow. It's one of a kind in the state, in the region, and we continue to expand and, and utilize the local cardiac resources. I think we, we are uniquely staffed, right? Because we have the opportunity for uh, a reach out. If I need to call Dr. Marin or Dr. Rowan and say, this is your patient, but they're seeing me today, this is what we're thinking. Between us, we're able to really deliver that high level of care very, very simply. And when we tell people about what we do, I say, look, we can send you anywhere you want. But when you go to Tufts, Marty calls me after the surgery. He calls me the day after. There's a, an ease of care and, and it, clearly an integration. And, and of course, for me, the opportunity to, to, to discover and continue to understand and provide education to this population of HCM. So that's our entire program. It's growing. We're excited to be here and, and continue to integrate with, with Lisa and her team. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matt. I do have to say for full disclosure, um, this is a unique center that actually has a steering committee and I am a member of that steering committee. And back um, in 2000, or actually back in 1995, my sister passed away at Morristown. And at that time, it was a hope that someday maybe we could improve care right here at our home where she would have landed. And um, it took a while. Um, I tease it took took a girl to take charge. You needed Linda Gillum to get in there and take the leadership of the cardiovascular program. And she called me one day and said, all right, we've got some money on the table. Thank you to the masks. To start this, what do we need to do? And I said, eh, bring me a Marin. And they did. So that was nice. Um, and it started a really good relationship between Tufts and, and um, and Morristown, and it kind of brought my world a little closer together. And it was able to basically bring HCM care literally to our home. So um, I'm very appreciative of the services and I have been a consumer of the product uh, at various levels as as many members of my family and some additional members of my family soon to be added, who knows when labor will start. Uh, so near and dear to my heart. So what I wanted to do now is um, pivot the conversation a little bit um, to some organizational issues with the HCMA. And because we have, this is, this is not your typical big hearted warrior tour. We've done like 15 of these so far. This is gonna be a little different tonight because I have some amazing fun news. I was hoping to give it to you completely, but it's still gonna be in somewhat fragments. Tomorrow, we will be launching a brand new HCMA website and you are going to get a tour at about 735 this evening of the new website and some of the new resources. It is still a work in progress. It will still be built out, but you're going to see more about that later. So I'm going to keep my comments abbreviated tonight, but I do want to talk to you about some important stuff that's happening. So let me get my PowerPoint up and ready to go. And then I can have that conversation with you all. And let me just close this one and bring you guys over here and then grab that little button over there. Gotta love Zoom, don't you? Okay, so I think you should be seeing my screen now, correct? Yes, okay. 
the green bars have disappeared off of Zoom, which really confuses me because I like the green bars around the screen that I'm showing you. Um, so tonight you're going to hear from Matt Martinez, myself, Marty Marin, and Deidre DeBose, and we're going to get into a really interesting conversation later. So stay with us for that. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cytokinetics, and Vitae Boston Scientific, who with with their amazing research and their interest in HCM, I think we are all benefiting, not only in this tour series, but in some of the initiatives that Dr. Martinez mentioned earlier. Uh, some of the things that are going on at ACC are funded by these same individuals who finally found, as I'm referring to us now, ladies and gentlemen, we were the island of misfit toys. I'm happy to announce the cruise ships have arrived. It's our job to make sure that they don't pollute while they're here. So things are changing in HCM. I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk about the importance of the Center of Excellence programming. Uh, I took one of my slides out because Dr. Martinez used it earlier, and that's showing a comprehensive, a primary, and a general HCM doctor at home and the differences of all these programs. What's not mentioned in those guidelines that everybody worked on is where did this concept come from and how did these programs get to be developed in, in a formal, structural, yet not way? So back in 1996, when this HCMA started, there were five clinicians who had a specialized interest in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at five, six different institutions around the country. A couple of other docs did a little bit of dabbling in HCM, but there were really five major players. And when I first started meeting you all, when the HCMA's work began, we would have everybody get on airplanes and fly to doctors. Well, that's not really something that we can all do. And in fact, I just spoke to a new potential partner today that's looking to provide micro loans to some patients to get them gas money to go to the doctor. Not everybody can fly across the country. That in combination with 2008 and the advent of the Affordable Care Act, which started to silo patients to be in a particular state, that really kind of ignited the growth of centers. Some, some came on in the early 2000s, but most of them were after 2008 and the ACA. Today, the HCMA has 42 centers of excellence operating throughout the United States. We have some international collaborations as well, which I'm gonna update my map soon so I can include those as well. And we have a number of them that are in the pipeline for development. One is out to the board for review right now. It won't change the demographics at all because it's a second center in a, in a large city, but we have some other centers that are hopefully coming online shortly. Um, we hear you out there when you say, but it's still far to go. We know that that's a problem. And in fact, we're addressing that problem. And actually Marty Marin and I are partnered with a new company out of the UK who's going to provide what I'm referring to as spoke education models. We have three pilot um, areas that we're gonna be starting with, like actually it's starting, it's happening right now, um, to develop training modules so that the centers of excellence can go out in a very systematic way and provide education to community doctors so that they can help identify HCM and help manage you at home in collaboration with a center. So there's efforts underway to not only take these dots and make more dots, but to spider them out so that those dots start to overlap and that care is not so far away. We want you to get the best care possible, as close to home as possible, but some of you are going to have to travel and we're looking for resources to assist in that as well. But for now, this is why Center of Excellence Care Matters because they provide the most comprehensive care possible for those with HCM and ensure you get the right care, not too much, not too little, and not the wrong procedure as often as possible. We all know we can't guarantee anything in this world. And even with the best care, unfortunately, sometimes we don't always win the battle with HCM, but with this network and the partners that we have now, we're certainly going to give it one hell of a fight. Um, this is not my typical talk because I'm cutting a bunch of slides out so we can talk about other things later. But I want to remind you all, if you're not watching on Facebook, if you are a Facebook person, or even if you're not really a Facebook person, 
but you want to join a community of conversation, you don't have to do anything else on Facebook. Just come talk to us. We have a group of about 7,800 people right now in a private group. Um, not exactly very private, but the experiences of others and the camaraderie is wonderful. We have a parents network. We have a general communication room. And as of about three weeks ago, we started our first foreign language and that is Swedish. We have a bunch of Swedish um, women who are very interested in helping their um, Swedish HCM big hearted folks. And we're gonna be working with Italy to put a shared program up with them. So they anchor to the HCMA, they'll translate through the HCMA website, but you'll have patient advocates um, who are somewhat trained and, and enhancing their training to be able to guide you through the healthcare systems that exist in your country in your native language. So that's always a fun thing. Um, we have our online discussion groups. We took a little hi hiatus for a couple weeks while the website was being developed. So we'll be back in July with a lot of programming and you'll be able to sign up for that real soon. These are our real life moderators and we thank them all for their volunteerism. Um, we started these as support groups. We've turned them more into discussion groups. It's because it's gonna happen a little bit later on tonight. That interactive discussion really does breed better understanding. Um, if you haven't tuned in for Tales from the Heart, Marty joins me once a month, Harry Lever joins me once a month, and we have conversations about interesting topics. I think we're up to episode 25 right now. Um, we'll grab Matt and throw him on a Tales from the Heart soon too, as well as their, their new surgeon to figure out why somebody would want to join this space. Um, and tomorrow, I actually have Harry Lever at 11 o'clock for a podcast, and Marty at 2, I think, with their new surgeon up at Tufts. So you might wanna join in tomorrow at two o'clock and hear about the new surgeon at Tufts. Uh, so lots of new surgeons going around. In the next couple of weeks, you're gonna get an offer to participate as a legislative advocacy partner with the HCMA. We are going to train you on the topics that we're trying to move through state legislators. Um, we've passed these laws in the state of New Jersey. So we're looking for people outside of New Jersey, uh, particularly to assist in this specifically to ensure that screenings, um, when you do a well child exam, that we start asking family history of heart health and about that child's symptoms to see if there might be some indication that the child should be referred for additional screening for cardiovascular disease, including HCM. Um, we are always advocating for good um, AED CPR legislation, as well as healthcare access issues. On the regulatory side, we are currently working with the FDA and a group called ICER, very separate issues, all about the Mavicampton product that is um, likely going to, it's at the FDA for review right now, likely going to hear back the end of January whether or not that's going to be available or not. So we need to make sure that your voice is everywhere it needs to be on this issue, pricing, availability, safety, effectiveness, we're working with regulatory agencies to ensure that your voice is heard as much as possible. And there will be times coming up in the near future, like September, for patients to participate in some sessions as well and share your voice directly, not synthesized through the HCMA. Um, if you have not watched PFDD, it's the anniversary of the PFDD, but it is an important piece to go watch if you really wanna understand what other patients feel, what they're going through, et cetera. I'm going to pause on this one for a, an unrelated topic. If you go into the video, you'll see there's about 10 stories featuring HCM patients. This is an official call out. I'm going to be looking for five people who've not shared their story yet, who will fit a pathway of HCM to open their hearts, their homes, their medical records for a case assessment and a videographer to come see you this summer for this program that uh, Dr. Marin and I are working on for patient ed or for physician education, we want to feature your stories. So if you are willing to share your story, which would include having the physicians kind of talk over your case, share images, copies of EKGs, echoes, MRIs, et cetera, if you're willing to consent to that and you wanna share your story and help educate, please email Julie and say, I'm interested. We have a lot of people who are gonna be interested but we need to tell the right stories. Not that all of you don't have right stories, but they have to fit into the module of education. So if you're not chosen for this one, we have other opportunities that are gonna be coming up as well to do this type of thing. We will also use this information on the HCMA website and possibly in social media, obviously not with patient identifiers. 
So um, if you're interested, let us know. And with that, why is this not going? Ah, um, sorry, I forgot about this one. If you have not had genetic testing yet and you would like genetic testing, the Invite uh, program is still available and it is free to you and your family if you have HCM suspected or diagnosed. Um, so you can go onto the website, the old one and the new one, and you can take the information on that program and bring it right to your physician. Um, it's June, so I took a family photo for June. Um, unfortunately, June is the month that my family tends to leave in. So my dad passed on June 8th, 2008. My sister passed on June 16th, 1995. And my grandfather died on June 21st, 1953, 68 years ago. Um, if anybody ever asks like, why does Lisa do what she does? This is the past and I don't wanna add anybody else to this slide. I have many family members currently living with HCM and I want to make sure that they live to be old and gray and annoying and have wonderful long lives with lots of grandkids and things like that. So that's why I do what I do. I want to give a very special thank you to my team at Morristown, the HCMA program, as well as the rest of the team there that helped me personally over the years. Um, all of our Center of Excellence partners and staff members, board members, which includes Steve Winters from Morristown was a founding board member of the HCMA and uh, was actually one of Lori's physicians. So um, it, it started way back then and he stuck with us all this time. And of course to Brandy, my donor, without whom I wouldn't be here today. So I'm gonna hand it back over to you guys and who's coming up next? We have Marty coming up next. Whoops, stop sharing my screen, Lise. Uh, Marty, you're gonna talk to us a little bit about this relationship between Boston and Jersey. Sure. You all kind of talk a little funny, but that's okay. <laughs> sure. Um, thank you. And uh, so uh, first, you know, thanks, Matt. That was a great overview and introduction to the program. I thought you did a great job of summarizing um, how it started, what's happened over the last eight years and the direction um, that we want to lead the program in. So thank you for that. I I'm going to be just be really brief here, um, you know, and just say a couple things, and then we can move on to what probably most people are interested in, which is some questions and learning more about the disease and <clears throat> um, being able to ask us some questions. So to be brief, I'll just mention a few things that I think are important. So when I had a conversation back almost 10 years ago or so with Bob Mast, who, as you heard, really was the the reason that the Morristown HCM Center exists. He was um, very passionate in providing the support to start the the program in in New Jersey. He and his wife Terry, and that came out of uh, you know tragedy. Um, he lost his daughter Shannon uh, to HCM at a young age, um, and he um, turned that tragedy to the best that they could, Terry and Bob, into something positive by giving to um, Morristown to create something from nothing, uh, which was the HCM Center, and which, was, which is the only named HCM Center in the world. And when I asked him, you know, what his vision was and, and why he was, you know, interested in, in having Tufts involved, it was it came down to two things being able to deliver the highest level of care for hcm patients but two equally as important was the opportunity to really look at hcm patients in a holistic way to really treat this condition and the individual patients with this condition um, in, a, in a holistic manner to really take into account um, the whole person, um, not just treating the disease itself. And Bob felt that that that, that was something that, that Tufts could do um, really well. And uh, I was honored that he reached out to us in that capacity 
Um, and it was really through that reaching out and, and, and goal of providing really the first holistic approach to HCM um, that we were able to enter into uh, an arrangement to come down to Morristown uh, and, per, and, and start the center um, with that mission and aim in, in mind. And I think perhaps, you know, personally, I, I'm most proud of, 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 the, of, of that part of it, the ability and opportunity for patients in the entire tri-state area, as well as other parts of the East Coast to come to the Morristown HCM Center to see myself, Matt, uh, my colleague, Ethan Rowan, Dietra, the entire staff, and, and be treated and evaluated and followed, you know, uh, in a certain way um, that I think is different than um, any other HCM center that exists. And um, for that, you know, I think we, we are grateful um, for the opportunity to be able to do that. And so I've always told Bob and Terry that that, 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 you know, is something that they did that I believe, you know, changes the world in a way. Um, and so that, that's really, I think one of the, one of the major points about this collaboration is, is, is how we, how we, how we treat the patients as a whole. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that because I think Matt really covered a lot of the other logistical aspects, you know, to the relationship. Um, and, and I think we'll, we'll leave it at that because that's really what I wanted to say. Thanks, Marty. I will tell you that when the program launched in 14 and we started this collaboration. It wasn't just because I didn't like going to Boston every six months or so to see ya. We just wanted you down here and you could do the traveling then. But <laughs> it worked out very, very well, you know, from a logistical point of view, from somebody who lives in New Jersey, having to travel a great distance to a program. It made it easy without giving up quality. And I think over time, the program has enhanced and grown <clears throat> and has, gotten to the point where they needed to say, okay, Matt, that other place doesn't need you anymore. Come on out here. Finally, I've been trying to get Matt in New Jersey for like almost what, 15, 18 years or whatever it was, maybe longer. True story. Yeah. Um, I told them to, not to come the first time we weren't ready for him, but we're ready now. And we're really happy to have him here. So um, it's, it's unique and it's different. And I'm going to unpin you from the top. So you don't have to be pinned. Um, and now I, I wanted to kind of get into this top 10 concept. Wait, so two, oh, two, Deetra, Deetra. two things. So, so yeah. I, we, we got to hear from Dee because she's going to, she's Dee. in the glue and she'll Dee. continue yeah. to glue this together. But Marty, I'm not going to let you off the hook that easily because I, I feel like you've gotten a one year COVID hiatus and I know you're missing the hotels and can't wait to get back on the train there's a lot of discussion. We're wondering when we're going to see your your newly cut hair down here in the great state of New Jersey. <laughs> oh man, you got me. You you got me in the corner. Oh, I was hoping to. I was I was hoping uh, that I could avoid that question. Um, well, look. I, I mean, I think here's the deal. Um, you know, I think we're still. Uh, personally, and when I say we, I, I'm, I'm really speaking as well for Ethan Rowan as well. And, um, you know, I, I'll just say I'm really, you know, first of all, really proud to, 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 you know, to work with, with, you know, with this team. Ethan has done an incredible job over the years. He's given his heart and soul to the clinic as well that included before COVID, you know, really coming down every month for several days away from family and, 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 and being able to immerse himself into giving great care. And, you know, we're thrilled, Matt, to be able to the opportunity to work, you know, with you. Um, you're such an incredible addition. You know, I think, I think it's gonna, you're gonna continue to lead this in, 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 an, in, in an incredible direction. So with that said, I think, you know, what, what Ethan and I are, are, are and D, by the way, we love you. Um, you know, I, I don't even want to, I can't even, you know, we, we don't have enough time to tell, you know, how much we appreciate 
all the hard work you give to the patients and and the program and to us because we're a pain we can be a pain in the ass and um i get that and uh, it's a complicated arrangement since we're not on the ground so to speak ethan and i so we appreciate everything that you do for the program and the patients thank you i think i'll just say I, matt it's a great question i think we're thinking and evolve and, and and analyzing the situation uh you know kind of as it as we kind of come out of this pandemic and and you know our hope is you know once we feel comfortable that we're we are really out of the out of the out of the gate in terms of safety and everything else and that it looks like we're we're we're, we're really in smooth sailing we're going to reevaluate coming back down in person you know so i think reality will be that it will ultimately the answer to your question probably be a hybrid situation where we will be coming down i don't know about as much but we will be coming down and we will be supplementing that with what we've been doing as you said the last year with telemedicine yeah, I think that's kind of what I, I, I expected you to sort of, uh, you know, say that. And that's, I think, what we've discussed multiple times, that I am I am truly honored that you uh, entrusted me and that Dee has uh, also learned to tolerate my <coughs> quirks on occasion. Um, and, and I think the collaboration works very well. Uh, you know, we have weekly meetings with Tufts. It's actually quite fun to, to get on the horn uh, Mondays at 1230. So I, I think it's working, but I, I love the hybrid idea. We certainly want to, you know, utilize you to the best of your resources and what your family will tolerate and, and Ethan's. Sure. I appreciate that. And the intent is, is to make it work in a, in a, in a way that makes it work for all of us in, in person. So we'll, we'll, we'll be probably deciding soon. It was a really good attempt at a diversion there to put the attention on D there for a while, Matt, Mar um, Marty. I was going to like bring you back to it, but you did circle back. So bravo to you for a good attempt to divert the question, but you did it. I learned that from our politicians. They they they've taught if they've only taught us one thing, it's called diversion. And so uh, that was a technique I've learned uh, over the last couple of years. Is when you're getting an uncomfortable question, just divert. <laughs> it's as easy as that. We'll hold your feet to the fire. Don't you worry about that. Right. Ditra, my dear. Um, so, you know, this is a little personal for me and a little professional because there was a day in September of 2016 that I showed up at the HCM Center myself and I'm like, Ditra, something wrong. And she just looked at me, she's like, stop right there. So we've been, we've been through some battles together and uh, happy to be on the other side of all of that. So, Dietra, you're on mute. Unmute yourself, share your screen, and tell us about the center from your perspective. Shared screen. I have to apologize. I am not. Oh, here we go. The most politically savvy. So, our uh, computer savvy, I should say. Let me. There you go. Yeah, well, let me get myself together. I'm trying to uh, get my slides. So, if you bear with me, they're there. I just need to get to the front. So uh, this will be quick because I know we want to certainly get to the, the fun part. So my part is how to get started here at the Channing T Mass Center at Barstown. And it, it's quite simple. It all starts with the phone call. You give us a call at 973-971-5899 to make an appointment to see one of our HCM specialists. Of course, it would be helpful if you had your medical records faxed to our fax number, which is 973 Two nine zero seven one three nine, and when we're looking for medical records, we certainly are looking for your cardiac records, cardiac caths, nuclear stress test, any echoes, any stress echoes, any cardiac MRIs or event monitors or halter monitors, anything of the such that would be helpful to make your consultation with their HM specialists a success. And when you do call our phone number, there are a plethora of people who would pick up the phone. And it's always nice to be able to associate a face with the voice that you may be speaking with. These are pictures of our medical staff. We have four medical assistants currently. Uh, the first one you might have seen in the slide that Dr. Martinez showed, her name is Sarah. Uh, she is, uh, also has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and our patients find uh, it easy to relate to her because she does have the condition and she's out there working and uh, she is a great model to show, yes, you can lead a healthy lifestyle uh, with this condition because she's doing it so. She's awesome. Uh, our second person that we have there is Soline. 
our third person there was a, a young thing named Charlize. And of course we have Janice who's been with us for quite some time. She's our lead medical assistant. If you don't speak to one of these four lovely ladies, you perhaps might be speaking with uh, our medical office assistant. But before I show you the picture of her, our medical assistants will help coordinate and they're involved in your patient appointment. They come in, they bring you to the exam rooms, they do your vital signs, ask you questions about your current medications, your past medical history. You wanna make sure that your chart is accurate before the HM specialist comes into the room or sees you virtually, as Dr. Marin did discuss, hybrid, to make sure that the chart is accurate prior to them perusing your chart and coming into the patient room. Oh, I had medical assistant, but our medical assist office assistant is Christina Walker. She's one of the, the fifth ladies that you may potentially speak to when you call to make an appointment. We have two registered nurses in our office now. The first one's name is Christina De Jesus. She's our clinical coordinator. And we also have Karen DeMarco. These lovely nurses help to coordinate and plan the care that has been established by our HCM specialists. They're wonderful women. You more than likely will be speaking to them after the consultation with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy specialist or after a follow-up visit with one of the HCM specialists or myself. And then there's me. Ta-da! with a different hairdo at that time. I'm a nurse practitioner. I am also a provider. I, sometimes you may see me doing family screenings for patients to rule out hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A lot of times you will see me for follow-up visits. A lot of times the HCM specialist will place you on medications to help address your heart failure symptoms. And then you'll see me to make sure that those medications are working well for you. Sometimes for the follow-up visit, there may be some tweaking or you might feel like a million bucks and may not need anything at all, but we need to make sure that we document that, that you're feeling great on the current plan. So a lot of times you will see me for follow-up visits. Another time that you may also see me is in the hospital. Sometimes our patients have to be hospitalized for whatever reason. I know Lisa had mentioned something about our visit in 2016. I took one look at her and said, oh, you need to go to the hospital. We got to fine tune you up, girl. So a lot of times you will see me in the hospital should you need fine tuning. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. Or if you need to have arrhythmia medication changes, sometimes that require hospitalizations and you will see me there as well. Uh, I also see patients by background in addition to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My background is actually cardiac surgery with which I have been a nurse practitioner in cardiac surgery for 20 years and I still dabble my toe in that. So you will see me, for those patients who have septomyectomy surgery at Tufts Medical Center, you will see me preoperatively because I help to coordinate the preoperative workup to get you ready for your Tufts visit. And I help coordinate that with the Tufts hypertrophic cardiomyopathy team in Boston, as well as the surgical team up in Boston. And then there is a two-week post-operative visit when you return to New Jersey that you will see me. And I will make sure that your incisions look like a million bucks. If there's any lingering post-operative issues, I help to coordinate that care in conjunction with the Tufts medical professionals to make sure that your post-operative course continues to run smoothly. And then I help to coordinate that eight-week uh, post-operative visit with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy specialist, either hybrid or in person. And I think I have did all that I do. And this is what our building looked like. We were at 111 Madison Avenue. We're not too far from Morristown Medical Center. If you're coming from 287, going away from 287, you will drive past the hospital. And we're like two to three buildings on the right. There's free parking. Woo! So you can just grab a spot and come to see us on the third floor. We're in suite 301. And that concludes my piece of it. And okay. I, now, how do I get out of here? I'll do it. Stop shit. Okay, perfect. I got Thank you. I got you covered. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the gallery view so I can see everybody. Okay. Matt, it is 6.52. I'm being really cautious on timing tonight because some things are going to be interesting in timing. Okay. So Matt, we're going to put up this top 10. Marty, come on back and join us on screen um, when you can. And uh, we're going to we're going to do something a little different here, folks. So if you're watching on Facebook, I have put the link to the sent to the session in the link and you can just come into the zoom. All you have to do is download zoom and you can be here. So what we're going to be doing now is something a little different. Uh, we're going to do the top 10 things you need to know about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We're going to have um, 
Dr. Martinez kind of start the conversation with some basic information. And then we're going to get some interactive conversation between Marty, Matt, Dietra, myself, and then we're going to take questions as we go. So there is a Q&A box at the bottom <clears throat> of your screen. You can put your questions in there. Um, I will also try to peek for some hand raises and I, you can use the chat feature if you can't figure out how to use the Q&A feature, trying to make this as easy as possible for you. Um, but we can't bring you on microphone now because it will just, it won't work out very well. So you use the Q&A box if you have any questions or you can use the chat, but better use the Q&A box. On our marks, get set. Matt, Marty, you were on the guidelines committee. Number one, did everybody get out okay or was there blood involved with anybody? Uh, <laughs> and what was the most important thing you learned? I think, um, first of all, it was quite a journey, right? We learned quite a bit and it, it took a couple of years. We met once in uh, Dallas and uh, spent a, whole, a day and a half there trying to sort through uh, best practices. And, and that's where some of the bloodshed may have occurred, but uh, not a whole lot of bloodshed, but there was certainly some, some discussion. And I guess what I learned, Marty, and I'd love to hear what you said is that twofold. One, uh, having a patient on the committee was huge, huge. You, you, you kept you honest. You had to tell them th they were in the room, right? So they heard all the discussion and, and we had to be real with what was happening. And, and she was super smart and, and was able to, to, to keep us on task. And the second biggest, uh, there were three big take homes for me. The second biggest one was integrating pediatric cardiologists more aggressively, I think helped us all think differently about how this is approached. And the third part of that is how clinical practice can vary quite a bit, uh, even amongst experts. And we had a lot of discussion about what, what risk meant and how you use, how to use, utilize MRI. And we'll talk about MRI in a little bit, but uh, you know, Marty and I had a couple of moments where we were looking at each other saying, but, but that's how we do this, right? So we have to include that in the guideline. And um, I think having those three pieces in the room and having us sort through this with, with a group of new faces was, was really, really superb. Agree, Marty? Was there blood? <laughs> yeah, I don't, actually, I, actually, what I heard was that it was one of the more tamer yeah. um, guidelines in terms of blood relative to other guidelines. Um, so apparently it was actually fairly mellow. Um, so take that and, and do with it what you want. But I, I thought that was interesting too. But anyways, it went well. Uh, so I, I would say this. So so the, 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 the ACC and the media, you know, what the message that came out of the guidelines in terms of, of what I seen mostly from those groups was that, that, that the guidelines emphasized the importance of shared decision making in ACM. I heard that a lot. And, and I look, I think shared decision making is really important. I, I think though that that message about the importance of, of utilizing shared decision making, and we can talk about what that really means in a minute for those that aren't, aren't familiar with that term. I think it kind of overshadowed a little bit what I thought was the most important points of the guidelines which were that this is a treatable disease, even today in 2020, um, that the current contemporary treatments of mature risk stratification strategy with the ICD can make an enormous difference in preventing sudden death in many, many, many patients. The opportunity for current drugs and invasive treatments myectomy and alcohol ablation, which by the way, are fairly mature procedures today. I mean, uh, surgery is 60 year history and alcohol ablation tw almost 20 or so years. And so those procedures and, treat and drug treatments improve quality of life in an enormous number of patients. And of course the opportunity with uh, treatments for atrial fibrillation and, 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 and blood thinners to, to protect patients with this disease from stroke. So, so, so the guidelines really, I think, did a very nice job of, 
putting together clear, concise pathways that clinicians anywhere in the world can use to translate these contemporary strategies and treatments to patients anywhere in the world to achieve great outcomes today. And I thought that was the message that really was the most important from the guidelines. So let's dive in. Marty, I, I think for me, the, the best part of my day is when a patient leaves the room and says, I feel so much better about this condition after I was here. Right. That's right. I mean, you know, when you talk to them in, in the way that, you know, we do with our center in a holistic way and, and you take them through the deal and you see the light bulb kind of go off, you know, in, the, in their eyes and the, to understand that it's going to be okay and that there are treatments and that the opportunity to live a normal life with good quality of life exists for the majority of patients is really one of the more satisfying things that we do for sure. And the guidelines, the guidelines emphasize that, you know, and I, and I thought that that part of it for some reason didn't seem to come out as much as it, as it should have in the, in the, in the PR part of the guidelines, um, which seemed to focus more on, you know, these issues of shared decision making, which of course are important, but but sort of in ways are, are in the shadow of all the other enormous advancements that we've just talked about. And also bring into question some much more difficult questions about shared decision making versus what the payers are willing to do. So there's there's some there's some issues we still need to work out here. So let's hit the top 10 list and Matt gets to choose where we start. So uh, Marty, you're a couple of steps ahead of me, um, but we're going to talk about shared decision-making. It's on the list. What we thought, you know, Dee kind of kind of threw this up there and I thought we might start with that where, you know, family screening is a big part of why folks come to our practice. They come because somebody told them somewhere, maybe you, maybe some, another center, um, or that they heard about it, right? Thankfully, right. centers do a great job of telling patients, find a cardiologist who understands HCM. And as you know, right, as we all know, this is an autosomal dominant condition, right? It's a 50-50 chance of getting it. It also means you have a 50-50 chance of, of course, not getting it. And there is a variable penetration, right? So not everybody exhibit, just because you carry the, the, the protein, the, the change in the M MYBBC or, or MYH7 or the troponin gene doesn't mean that your that mutation is definitely going to manifest. And then even within the same families, there seems to be quite a bit of variability. And D, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if you're comfortable, I may ask you to weigh in on some of this. You, you do this all the time, right? We we have discussions about you either see them after or or before, right? And you make the decision and talk to folks about what their options are stolen right from the guidelines, right? This is right where it's from. And before we go on to this, Lisa, do you want me to address the chat question about the guidelines or did you do it? I was gonna put a, I'm, I'm working on that right now. I'm giving them the link to the HCMA site where I have a copy of the guidelines posted. Perfect. And I'll get to the copy of those guidelines. So I've got that. So Dietrich, walk me through this, right? Straight through the guidelines. This is uh, sort of how we do it when folks come. Yeah, when folks come, uh especially we look at children, uh, we get EKG and echoes first to see if there are any abnormalities in their EKG or echo. If the EKG looks abnormal or if the echo looks mildly suspect, and what we're looking for is maximal wall thickness of uh, the normal is about six to 12, give or take. So if they have something that looks 13, 14 or 15, it is kind of gray in those areas. We're looking more for maximal wall thickness of 17 and above. But if it looks like there's some thickening there that's greater than 12, we automatically get a cardiac MRI uh, as part of the screening process. A am I spot on for you, Matt? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, M Marty and I will, will weigh in on that, that gray zone portion sometimes, but a, a lot of times it, it's, they come in, they meet you and they say, it's my third visit here to the program. Uh, I, I met Dee a couple of times before you, she's great. So uh <laughs> Sometimes it's, well, why are you here? <laughs> so, so I, 
So we walk through, sometimes there's one that you say the ECG now changed, right? And I, I need you to help me sort out what the next best steps are, or I ordered the MRI, now, now let's have you meet with them to go through it. Um, Marty, I think we do more imaging probably than, than anything else in, in terms of advocating that for families. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we do. And I think the reason that we do that is that there are, you know, there still remain a lot of limitations to using genetic testing to determine if family members are at risk or not of developing HCM in the future. You know, those include, the, you know, the, the fact that genetic testing is kind of a low yield to begin with to find the mutation. We still can't do that in almost 60% of patients. And if you can't find the mutation, then obviously you can't test family members to see if they have that mutation that we don't know. So that that's a Achilles heel, you know, and so that's kind of the dampened enthusiasm a little bit for using genetic testing for that purpose. And then the other obviously big issue is, you know, the, the, the implications of, of genetic testing in terms of, you know, insurers and getting labeled with a disease when you may be just a carrier of the mutation as a child, never actually it's possible you may never actually express HCM since not all individuals who carry a mutation actually ever express the disease. So, you know, because of those limitations, I think that our group, you know, has been kind of putting greater weight on the imaging component to screening, you know, and, and I think that makes sense, you know, for all those reasons. And, yeah, I agree. I think the other part that I always, I feel like I overemphasize this is that if yeah. the genes are negative, we're not yeah. done, right? Right. And it becomes so confusing to the, the patient and their family when they say, no, no, wait, I, I have thickness. I, we've called it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but the genes are negative. So I don't have the disease, right? No, no, wrong. We still got a screen, right? We still got to look for other family members. And uh, in that way, the, the echo is sort of a, a reassurance for that, right? Rather than get losing them. That's my always fear is that, that th they come back 12 years later with a 40 millimeter thick septum. And I think, holy macro, what did we miss here? That's right. I'm going to pause you on that one to address something that happened in social media a couple weeks back in our private discussion group. An individual came in ecstatic that he screened negative for a gene for HCM. I don't like the word negative. I like no mutation identified. So he was no mutation identified. And he was on top of the world because his kids didn't need to be screened and everybody was okay. He became very upset when the community said, no, 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 that's not right. You need to go back and talk to your doctor about this because this is not the case. You need the kids to get screened. Um, sadly, the man left the group because we were, quote, raining on his parade. And I really do fear for his children that they're not going to get the screening that they need. So, you know, this is a really good point. And if, if you guys could please address the frequency in which you believe that people should continue to get genetic testing, like should they wait five years, 10 years, changes in panels, and how often should children be screened with ECHO and how often should adults and where's the line? Well, yeah, so you want me, so let me just, you know, you know, clarify in terms of genetic testing, you know, I think for the, for you know, those listening, you know, what we're talking about is that, you know, you, you, you may rightfully so have this perception because it's genetic testing talking about DNA, that it's, that it's binary, you know, you either have the mutation and it's disease causing, or you don't have a mutation. And uh, I can understand how, you know, you could think of it that way, because that's kind of how I thought about it until we started to um, learn a lot more about genetic testing 20 years ago. Unfortunately, it's not it's not like that, you know, the, there, there is a lot of nuance that goes into determining whether the mutation, a mutation that's identified in the blood of a patient with HCM is actually a disease causing mutation or not. And sometimes there's a lot of gray there. And even sometimes what is perceived to be something at one point in time, disease causing 
may actually change based on emergence of new data and science. And, and so we, there is this issue of reclassification of, of, of mutation sometimes in, in this disease. And so that, you know, that makes, that makes it even more challenging genetic testing if, if, if the fact that you know, results can change in terms of their meaning with, with, with time. And so what, what the guidelines have recommended is that, you know, that patients try to, you know, remind their providers um, to reassess the classification of their mutations on a periodic basis, just to make sure that there haven't been changes to that mutation. How feasible that is and how practical that is, is uncertain, but that's, you know, that's kind of just where we are with the science and the tools that we have, um, is that that sort of falls on providers and patients to remember to, 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 to relook at that periodically, like every couple of years. Um, and then, you know, there's also the chance that the panels for HCM, the, the mutations that are on the panels can change as we discover potentially new pathogenic mutations. And so that's another question that comes up and, and, and sometimes it may be worth repeating it, the genetic testing, if the first go around was many years ago and it was negative, it may be reasonable to repeat that. Depends a little bit on the circumstances to see if the more contemporary panels may give a different result. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how I would look at those two issues. Matt, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I do the same. It's pretty unusual. I'll be honest for me to repeat gene testing. I, um, unless as you say, it's been a long time after and, and I'm waiting for a, a big leap in technology where all of a sudden there's something drastic that I say, holy macro, we've discovered six new genes and, and now all the testing is different. And, and I just haven't found that to to occur. I, um, in fact, the opposite where folks will come to me and say, I was uh, tested free. And they, and I say, I need to see the gene result. And they bring me a VUS and a, a variant of unknown significance or a VUS is, is maybe the, the most confusing of them all. And, and I love what you talked about with reclassification because that's the group that can go up. It can go down. It can become important. It, it could stay unimportant. And I try and hammer home the fact that the final common pathway is that expression. So right. carrying the gene is not enough. Um, you still got to look for, for expression of the gene. And, and that's where the echo is still our get out of jail free card. That's right. So I'm, <clears throat> I've just been on a panel um, and an NIH grant on the question of who's responsible for reclassification notification how long does the relationship between the lab and the patient last? How long does the relationship between the patient and the doctor last if there's a change in the understanding of the gene? So I will tell you all that this is an evolving science. Um, the NIH is paying attention to it. This group that I'm on has met for the past uh, three years to try to figure this out. And I suspect that in another eight to 10 months, we'll have a document published with some recommendations, but it, it's, it's a complicated area. Um, there's a question from Anne, are new HCM causing genes being identified? Yes, I think there's constantly a look for them, but it's not like they roll in every week with something major and new. Um, I don't know when there was the last major addition to the gene panel, um, but it, it happens every once in a while and it's not ever like a big chunk of the population. It's a one or 2% thing. So it's, we've, we found the heavy hitters. Now we have to go figure out what the rest of it is. And I know there's some efforts underway to go after some you know, big grants to hopefully answer those questions. So stay tuned, we're all learning together. Okay, so can somebody please address one other issue? Oh, you're doing this now on the surveillance on the, the frequency of echoes. Okay. Go, 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 go. I'm just, gonna, I'm just showing how this is an example of of, of what happens over time, right? Where uh, you have to keep looking. 
and the surveillance is really important. This is all, it, it's rarely year to year. And I tell people that, please don't be nervous about coming to see me. Uh, it's not going to be, hey, don't go anywhere. You need surgery tomorrow. That, that's not how this is going to go. Normal one year, grossly abnormal the next. But there's an evolution. And that surveillance you're showing here with the red arrows where it's normal, then a little thicker, and then really thick. It's just a reminder of how this begins to bloom over time. It's just such a critical piece to how we follow folks that it's not a once and done. And it's actually one of the things I really like about it, right? You develop a relationship with folks. I saw a kid today that I met 12 years ago and I, I said to him, are you 28? How did that happen? <laughs> so I, I think that's, you know, one of the fun parts of HCM is that you grow along with them and, um, you, you become very much part of their family physician. It's a unique cardiovascular uh, care model, I think. Yeah, um, I think <laughs> Marty has known my daughter since she was a, a baby and all the way through adulthood. So yeah, they, they see the whole progression. So the, what are the guidelines, seeing as we're talking about the guidelines here, what are the guidelines on how often one should be EKG and echo screened? And at what ages? Let's just go over that again. So I, I sort of put this up here, I think, for, to, to show Marty, you, you want to go through it or you want me to? I, I mean, it, it, I think it's a little easier in adults, right? Where if you've got a family history of HCM, I'll do the adult side, where if you have a family history, uh, at, at the time of diagnosis from another family member. So that year that uh, you should be screened and then every three to five years, depending on, I think, what we find. And uh, as an expert, we can guide you as to, you know, normal, normal, very normal, holy cow, normal versus, yeah, I'm not sure. Let's, let, let's see a little more frequently than that. And then um, I, I think initiation of screening for younger folks is, is somewhat nuanced. And, and we do it again at the time of diagnosis with another family member, but certainly not beyond the, the, the years of puberty. And I know Marty and I both see kids uh, 12, 13 years old for this purpose, where I, I love to include the pediatric cardiologist in this, the pediatricians in this, really a collaborative effort. And, and we can both see the patient and, and serve them. But um, I it's really important to be more frequent during those teenage years when I'm the most nervous about making the diagnosis. Okay. Any questions on that before we move on to the next? Okay, Doug, I took a negative genetic test. Also did not, did not test my kids. They are 15 and 17. Took them HMC a week for echo. AG both turned out fine, fully grown. According to the Pete cardiologist, they are out of the woods until there is a chance of them developing. Are they out of the woods or is there a chance of them developing? So are you telling us that you've only screened your kids at age 15 and 17? And what is the interval of that? I don't know. They, those children should be screened again in about two years. Would that be correct, Marty and Matt? And at the at two years, they should be screened again in about two years until they're fully grown. And then you can move it off to three to five years. Yeah. So yeah, here's the, here's the deal. You know, there, there seems to be something about puberty yeah. that, you know, facilitates the so-called turning on of the mutation to ultimately facilitate expression of the disease in terms of increased wall thickness. Okay. So that's a vulnerable period, puberty. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the, the frequency of echocardiographic screening is usually every one to two years in a child of an affected family member during that period of time. Okay. Now, of course, it's true that you can develop HCM before puberty, even from even at birth. You can have it. That's rare or un uncommon, but happens. So that, you know, the guidelines allow for some judgment here 
in terms of providing or in terms of doing echocardiographic screening in a pre-adolescent child. Okay. And so if there's concern on the parent's side, you know, anxiety at all related to whether that child before puberty could have HCM, then you know, I think it's very reasonable to get the echo. It's a safe test, it's non-invasive, uh, for all those reasons, can relieve anxiety um, if it's a normal study. And so that, that's, that's part of the guideline recommendations too. You can start before puberty in this situation. And there can be other situations where you would definitely probably want to do the echo before puberty. For example, if the child, of course, has any symptoms that could be attributed to possibly HCM, if that child is a you know, highly competitive athlete, you know, that may be a situation where it would be prudent to maybe do echocardiographic screening earlier, uh, or if there are any other red flags uh, as well, um, low threshold to do the echo as well, okay? So that's, that's kind of how we approach or think about echoes before puberty and during puberty. Yeah, and I love what you said about the, the athletics, right? If the, the, the more the more vigorous they participate, the, the more concerning I, I, the more aggressive I am, and I have to throw a plug in, right? For, for this is self promotion, in uh, all the more reason to see an expert in the field, right? So that the, these subtleties, these nuances can be discussed. It's not unusual for for um, you know Marty and I to say this is one of those times we're going to do it every year. And it's not unusual for us to make that decision. Sometimes it's based on family history. Sometimes it's based on, on a, a malignant family history or, or what that individual looks like or where the conditions seem to start in that family. So if we know that around you know, late teenage years, multiple times, this is when the expression starts to come. I'm pretty aggressive about saying, look, before you go to college, I got to get that echo. I got to feel comfortable about it. That's right. And, and, and I'll just say that's exactly right. And just one other point that, you know, is important. If the echocardiogram is done and there's any uncertainty about, you know, the wall thickness measurements, either because they're borderline or there are segments of the heart that are just not well seen on the echocardiogram or the EKG is abnormal, but the echo is red as normal. You know, those are all scenarios right. in which moving on to MRI for that child is really important to clarify without any doubt about whether there is HCM present or not. Yep. <laughs> okay, we're gonna to touch onto my most favorite topic. Um, and that is echo quality. Are all echoes created equal? The question is, do I need a specialist to do an echo or will a typical echo show the issues? Who wants to take the topic of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tap D on this one because she sees them first in typical sense. So uh, Dietra, um, is the community cardiologist as effective as an HCM protocol echocardiogram done in essential of excellence? Not at all. The, unfortunately, the community cardiologists, it depends on the echo equipment that they have. And, you know, finances plays a role in the quality of your echo machines. So a lot of times the community cardiology echoes are uh, not of good quality and not accurate in assessing uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And unfortunately, we get a lot of patients who have suffered from their uh, condition for years before they finally get to see someone with a better quality echo machine who's better able to detect that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So really, if you have a family history of HCM or you have, know of a, someone who's having symptoms of shortness of breath, the inclines and stairs and lightheadedness, they do need to go to a center of excellence to get the better quality echo. Because also too, an HCM center of excellence knows what they're looking for. They know what they're looking at. And a lot of times, unfortunately, community cardiologists don't know what they're looking at. They might see some hypertrophy and just make the assumption, oh, it's due to high blood pressure. You fix your blood pressure. We're going to fix your symptoms. And then you have patients with normal blood pressures and still have the symptoms. So uh, you certainly need to go to an HM Center of Excellence for sure. 
Any argument, doctors? No, I, I think it's important to know that, that, you know, Marty and I do this all the time, right? So it's, we're looking at the same, you know, images over and over. So we, the, the community, the, when you're a cardiologist in practice, you're doing all kinds of stuff. And, and it's not a, an indictment, right? These are busy folks who, who we're going to try and provide some better tools for them to, to identify what we're referring to as critical missteps, where you measure, how you measure, don't over measure, right? Don't, don't, don't measure the RV when you're just measuring the LV, careful with papillary muscles. And then recognizing that there are specific areas where the echo just doesn't do very well. And sometimes it's, it's because that individual has really big lungs or they've got other tissue in the way that uh, makes it difficult because the, the laws of physics of ultrasound can only do so much, you know, they can only go through so much body and, and they don't go through bone and, and that you have to be aware of where those potential pitfalls are. The, the inferior septal wall, the anterior wall, the, the anterolateral wall right next to the lungs, you're going to miss stuff. And that's when you're really going to, going to lean heavily on, I think I need an MRI in this indication. And there's uh, data from, from several, I think uh, Dr. Marin's data in uh, CERC 2005 or something like that, Marty, is, is, is part of that um, early description of the value of, of MRI. So um it's definitely a collaboration. We need to work better with our referring groups to help better under uh, identify uh, who has that thickness. But but clearly we are under recognizing HCM. There's no question about that. And, and I would argue amyloid as well. Well, any any LV agent, it's true reason for existing. I think we all have to do a little bit better job on. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to let this be the last question on this topic, and we're going to pivot to the next so we can introduce that before we take our break uh, for website visit. Um, somebody thought the genetic conditions meant you were born with it, i.e. being congenital. Can somebody in a couple of sentences explain the difference between a congenital defect and a genetic predisposition to a disease as it affects as HCM interplays there. Sure. So, so that's a good question, and it is confusing that, that kind of nomenclature. So I, I can understand um, where that uncertainty comes from. He, here's how I would kind of answer that: when we talk in terms of congenital heart disease, you know what we're really referring to there are diseases that are present at birth, okay? And, and in other words, the, 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 the structural abnormality for that disease is present at birth in the patient and can be detected at birth with testing. The, that congenital heart disease could be genetic in, as a cause, but the congenital heart disease term refers to presence at birth, really. And Genetic, on the other side of the coin, for example, like HDM, you could be born with a mutation that ultimately isn't expressed at birth or through you know, the beginning of life until adolescence, at which you only start to see evidence of disease expression, of any kind of disease expression. So it's not truly congenital because it wasn't there at birth, but it's a genetic cause that ultimately manifests early in life, but not at the time of, of, of birth. That, that's, that's really the distinction. Okay. So I hope that answers it. And the patient who commented about the echoes and where they should be getting them done, even as a patient, they claim they could see the difference between the center of excellence, echo quality, and the community hospital. So we're doing something right. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a pause from the top 10. Um, and I, I, out of transparency, I'm going to be honest in case we run into any technical difficulties here. Dr. Martinez has to play double duty on another meeting and that was pushed to this time after we had already set this time. So he's going to go away for a little bit and I'm going to now give you a tour of the new website 
and show you some of the things that we have created. So the doctors have left the building, but they're really still here. And for the next 20 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about what we built, why we built it, and how you can continue to help us build it in the future. Um, I have to say, I really was hoping that I was gonna show you the live version and let you go look at the website yourself tonight. Unfortunately, it's technology and doesn't always cooperate with me and we're going to be launching tomorrow. So um, here we go. Uh, are you seeing the proper screen here? Yes, you are. My staff is really kind of tired of looking at this website right now. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, with all the fanfare that I could possibly muster for a webinar meeting, um, this is the new Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association website, which we do believe will be a lot easier for you to all use as members, as members of the public, as constituents in committees, um, and, and our partners in our board. So this is the front page. We didn't just change the front page, we've changed our entire operating system and our front page of the website. So not only have we changed one major function of our daily life here at HDMA, we've changed everything all in one. So I'm gonna take you through a tour to help you understand how, how we've changed it and to also explain how all the data was compiled. There was a six level review process for all clinical data and data related to um, basically anything real disease related is, has gone through a six level step of review. Um, some of the other content about like about us and things like that that did not go through six level review because it didn't need to. So there was a med student who started, a professor who edited, a master's of public health who edited, um, a lay person who edited, a physician who approved and yours truly who's gone through it all. So there is a six level from the community, from patients, from physicians, from college professors to HCM experts. We've had every page reviewed at all of those different levels to ensure the highest quality possible. However, when it launches, if you see any glitches or mistakes, there's a tell us about it button and you can tell us about the problem and we will take a look at it. So when you come to the new site, it's gonna kind of look a little similar. I'm gonna just take you down the front page first. You're gonna have these four directional buttons which take you to the four major components of the website. If you click on the disease, you're gonna get some immediate information about what it is, how common, what does it look like? What are the names associated with it? When does it develop? What is heart failure in HCM? What's obstruction? What, does, what symptoms does HCM cause? Who in my family needs to be screened? What complications can HCM cause? Where do I find a specialist and how can I learn more? Boom, right there, one page. Pretty much all the things that once you're told hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and your head explodes, that's where your data can be found. So let's go back to the front page and take a look at what else can be found. This is still under some level of construction, but finding care. Not only are you going to see what a COE stands for, you're gonna have a little bit of an explanation of what it is and you can open these boxes up and it gives you the entire outline of how people get involved with centers of excellence, why you should go and how to make an appointment and what data you might need to gather to do so. And if you need any assistance in that, how to contact us. The end of the page, you're going to see the big map with all the little dots. That will tell you where our centers are. I know we have some work to do in the Midwest. I'm working on it, I promise. But then at the bottom, you're gonna have the Center of Excellence directory. And okay, this is what was holding up the website because this was a problem yesterday. What's going to be happening, I have one demo page that I can show you. The rest are going to load when the new, page, when the new site comes up. So all of the centers are in alphabetical order and you can also look by state. So we're gonna look at Advent Health in Orlando, Dr. Hasday and Anderson. You'll have their basic information, where they're located and their phone number right on the front page, but every center is going to be given a landing page. This is the base landing page for each center. It'll just have the number of people who are there, what their roles are in the program. But as we roll these out, 
things like Big Party Warrior Tour will be mounted right here on the page when we do a, an event with that particular organization. Publications that they've published, staff a little bit more in detail. We might even add pictures and things like that so you know who the staff members are. Um, so they're gonna be more information on each center as we move forward. So that's the Center of Excellence page of the directory. And then we're gonna go back to the front page, education and support. We've made it really, really easy for you to contact us so much so that you're gonna actually be able to just click on a little button and you're gonna find us. So Sabrina is one of our intake coordinators. Julie plays double duty as volunteer coordinator and intake coordinator, depending upon the hours of the day. And you can check your schedules to see when they're available and when their next slot is. And you can schedule an appointment and they'll call you and make it nice and easy. Um, unlike our current system where you're calling people and trying to get somebody in the plain telephone tag. We do now have live answers from 9 uh, a.m. Eastern time to 7 p.m. Pacific time, or no, 7 p.m. Eastern time, which we have somebody on the West Coast that covers those calls, that's Sabrina. But you can't always get somebody on the phone and you wanna make an appointment and schedule around it. We know how important your time is. You'll be able to schedule all those now. Um, so that's, that's really fun. I uh, go back here, uh, education and support. We've got that one. Oh, he's coming back sooner, so I can go faster. Um, let me just see what that said. Okay, I know exactly what time I have to go to. So we also have, I got a, oh, it's up there. Sorry, I'm still learning my way around myself. Advocacy, if you wanna get involved in advocacy efforts, you're going to be able to learn about some of our legislative advocacy initiatives here. And then in a couple of days-ish, you're gonna be able to sign up to be trained, but we quite haven't gotten there yet. And I just noticed there's still a sugar stock down there. See, we're still working this out. Okay, so you'll be able to engage with us that way. Now, if you get diagnosed with HCM and you come here, you'll see getting started. These are a lot of the same pages that are in the HCM, the disease place, but you can, access them from different places. What did your diagnosis mean? We have some video content here. I'm gonna let you go look at all that yourself. I'm not gonna take every page through. And I think one of the more important ones is the abbreviations page. Who are these people? What do these things mean? There's just a very simple understanding here of who everybody is, what the acronyms are, HOCM, HCM. Are they the same thing? Are they different? What is an IVS? What is an LA measurement? So we have a, this nice little data dump here where you can learn all about the acronyms. The most exciting part is still being built out to a certain degree because it's gonna have a lot more video content that we haven't quite gotten to yet. So we have the diagnostic journey. So every test you could possibly have, starting from the most common to the most rare, are right here on the page. So what is an echocardiogram and why do I need one? So you'll have a nice little explanation written at a very simple level but if you're a data geek and you wanna take a deeper dive, what is this all about? We've got you covered. So we take a very deep dive and all of our information is cited on each piece. You can share each page on Facebook if you want. We have social media integration throughout. You wanna know what symptoms are and how common they are. So here they are. What is shortness of breath? We will eventually be adding video content in all of these pages where patients will tell you themselves what they feel and how they express it. So that's gonna help understanding and, and knowledge going forward. What is shortness of breath? Why do we have it? Can it get worse? What are the other things that you might be doing that might be aggravating these types of situations? Obviously HCM is the focus of the page, but there are other things, maybe you're a smoker, maybe you, have um, COPD on top of your HCM. So we have to look at the whole thing. Treatment pathways, we go into very specific detail, surgeries, what types of surgeries might be done, medications, rhythm management, all of them are explained here in detail. Um, pathways of HCM, we talked a little bit about that today. What happens, we've got all of that there for you. Research, this is a really cool piece. I wanna show you this one. We have a filter called Antidote. If you're interested in learning about a clinical trial in HCM, you can answer a series of questions anonymously. You do not have to put your email address in. You can if you want, but you don't have to. And you can see what clinical trials are currently available, 
in the vicinity that you live in or whatever distance you're willing to travel. Just with a couple of clicks of the button, you can find out what trials you might be qualified for. I really love that piece. It's really fun. Um, oops, we went back here. Okay, so we've got the antidote piece. We also have the voice of the patient where we're gonna be sharing more and more of your stories. This is an area that's being built out. Right now we have the, some of the featured pieces that we used in the PFDV. So you can hear their, their patient experiences directly. And then we have uh, this new video about what the HCMA means to me. And you can hear what other people say about the services here. And you can also submit your own story and we can consider sharing it here as well. Remember earlier I mentioned I need five new people to share their story with us. Maybe this could be a place where it could live also. Um, Journey's glossary. We have more definitions here, a little deeper dive, a little bit more, and these are hyperlinked back into the pages. We have our programs explained very clearly, what our discussion groups are, and here is our new calendar. So you can just jump right on in. It's not live yet, so I can't show you how to sign up for a meeting. I'm so sorry. Um, but we will have all of them mentioned right here. And you get to meet the, the people who are actually running the sessions. A little bit of a bio about them, what they're looking to discuss in their group. Maybe you find a little bit of a kindred spirit here. And you can say, well, I think Karen's life and mine align a lot. So I want to find where Karen's meeting is and I want to join Karen's meeting or I want to join Bob's or Sidel's or whomever. But it just tells you a little bit more about who's running the meeting and, and what they're about and what their experience is. So the Center of Excellence programs, we kind of went over that already. That's in the program link, getting involved. We are gonna have a lot more opportunity for a lot more of you to get involved in committees and sharing your story and podcasting. So there's gonna be all of these different opportunities, event signups, volunteer signups, ways for you to get involved. Unfortunately for some of you, you might be dealing with a loss uh, related to HCM. So we have some special services here, and we also have a new memorial page that's being built out right now. And that tells you a little bit about who people are and why we mourn them. Um, that pops up kind of like this, a little story about Lori, um, my sister, um, and we're starting, oops. Hmm. Oh, little X over here. Um, but I do want to bring to your attention one special memorial, and that is Wyatt Jackson. Um, I've known his mom for many, many, many years. Uh, unfortunately, um, Wyatt's uh, HCM won on August 16, 2020. Lovely young man. His family was kind enough to raise money for the HCMA, and part of that money was used to build out this website. And um, so we've made sure that he's featured here and honored and one of our original memorial pages. There will be many, many more added. Um, there are some archived ones that we wanna bring back. Just because somebody died 10 or 15 years ago doesn't mean we can't remember them. Or in the case of my sister 26 years ago or my grandfather 68 years ago. HCM is generational and we need to honor those who've gone before us. So you can take a look at that page the HCM research page. There's a lot more we're gonna be adding into here. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this kind of tells you a little bit about who should be involved in research, why you wanna be involved in research. Um, genetic testing resources, somebody just asked me about this online. Where do I find the Invitae program? You click right there and it'll give you the application form or you can go to their website and you can do it from there. Um, so we've got the voice of the patient report available here for evaluation. This page is getting built out, Big Hearted Tips, which is going to just be a whole bunch of different tips from the community. Any of our mixed media channels, YouTube, podcasts, the video archive of this program, the Big Hearted Warrior Tour, journal articles, and our HCMA forum will be archived. We're not going to keep it active. Um, it's not going to be permitted to have new members, so it's going to get shut down completely, but we're going to leave the archive there. Reminding you all that if you buy on Amazon, and most of you probably do, you can choose the HCMA as your, um, you through Amazon Smiles as your organization. 
And that means every time you buy something on Amazon, it doesn't cost you a penny, but we get a few pennies. So we've raised a couple thousand dollars through this over the years. And it just, you know, every penny helps. And that's the way you can give and you don't have to take it out of your own pocket. You're spending it anyway. Amazon really gives it to us. Um, there's information here on ADA, Social Security, our Faces of HCM program. We'll actually get moved over to programs that doesn't belong in resources. Um, and then there's information for medical examiners. You can learn all about the organization. Y'all think it's just me doing all the talking all the time? Oh, no, 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 no. I have an amazing board of directors standing behind me and providing information, insight, and so much more um, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, I just noticed a couple of errors on this one too that have not been fixed. So I'm gonna have to get on that one as well. Um, our staff, you can see them all here. We are looking for a center of excellence coordinator right now. So uh, that, I thought I had it filled, but she took another job. So we're back to, to that one. And there's our wonderful staff. We're going to be building out committees. You're gonna be able to follow the committee structure here. And you're gonna be able to apply to participate in the committee. Um, as we move forward. So we've got that coming up for you. Our partnership page, we're really proud of. Um, you're gonna hear so much more in the next three or four months about all of the partnerships that HCMA has now formed with the National Forum, the Heart Failure Society, the Heart Valve Voice, Women Heart, American Society of Necrocardiography, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and more. So, Look forward to hearing about the alliance that we are forming with all of these organizations to help raise awareness about HCM worldwide. So uh, Global Heart Hub is also on here. So there's a whole bunch of organizations. And of course, how important the International Summit is, and that's gonna be in October, you all need to sign in for that one. We have a new store. It's not really up and running quite, hard, quite well yet, um, but you'll be able to put logos on your own items and order them at the quantities you want and HCMA receives a portion of that purchase. So the V-neck t-shirt that you want or the crew neck that you want or the long sleeve or the sweatshirt that you've been asking me for, you get to go make it now. It's pretty awesome. Um, there will be an additional store where you can get, oh no, it is working. Okay, so you can buy the book, you can buy other materials that we're gonna have internally and that's going to be there. Um, you can set your memorial page up there as well. Our contact us is always right here. You can find us. You can even see me on the map. Um, and if you have website feedback, you're just going to click on there and tell me what you, what you saw that's not working quite well or what you think should be different or what you think about it. So <clears throat> we have about five minutes until Dr. Martinez comes back and Dr. Uh, Marin come back. Um, so in that time, I hope you all enjoyed the new website um, and the little tour, which now we're going to be able to use that content online to tell people how to navigate the site. So thank you for that. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit about our poll this evening. So as of right now, the majority of you are joining us from the Northeast, although we have Southeast, Midwest, Canada, and other. I'm very curious about where the other is. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I covered all the continents. Um, the majority of you are patients and some of you are patients with another affected family member. And we have four members of industry joining us tonight. Hello, industry. Um, <clears throat> nobody who's just curious. Um, what are your family options here? Um, so somebody thought, or your, yours or your family's options. Somebody has been diagnosed within the last two years, about 6% of you. 63% uh, are on medication. 6% <clears throat> have had septal reduction therapy, 44% have atrial fibrillation, 19% of us have lost a family member to HCM. There's another transplant patient out there. So Amy, me, and that person, three hearts uh, among us, uh, actually six hearts among us. 38% uh, have had genetic testing. I'm a little surprised that that number is as low as it is. So we'll have to work on that. And somebody, a couple, 13% have been advised to have septal reduction therapy, but haven't done it yet. And that's kind of where we're at. Oh, I thought I was sharing those results with you as I was going, I'm sorry. Um, but there's your results, okay. So we have now a few minutes and a few questions. So I'm gonna go over some of these questions. That one's done. Um, oh, thanks for answering on genetics, you're welcome. 
Um, I have answered that line. Done. <clears throat> DTRA. This is definitely up your alley. Is H or HCM and heart failure the same things? I was diagnosed with HCM. Does that mean I have heart failure currently waiting on a COE appointment at Cleveland? So let's, we, we're talking about complicated topics today, you know, congenital versus genetic. HCM, by definition, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, thick heart muscle disease, heart failure. What's the difference? Well, there's two different types of heart failure. There's systolic heart failure and there's diastolic heart failure. Most people associate uh, systolic heart failure and that's a disease where the left ventricle does not squeeze very well. It's got a weak contractility. Or so when the heart left ventricle squeezes and pumps the blood out in the body, it doesn't have a forceful squeeze. That's called systolic heart failure. And a lot of people associate heart failure with that. But then there's a second type of heart failure, and that's more along the lines of what involves hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in that the heart muscle is not designed well. That's where the genetic component comes in to affect. There's a mistake in the blueprint or the instructions on how to create the heart muscle. So the heart muscle in HCM is stiff. And I, I compare it to a rubber band. You know, when you have a rubber band that's brand new, it's got all that bouncy elasticity. I compare a brand new rubber band to the likes of what a normal heart should be. But as the rubber band gets older, it gets kind of stiff and you can't pull it out in as much. That's like a, a, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart. It's thick, it's muscular, and it cannot expand to receive blood as well. So there's a limited amount of blood that fills an HCM heart because it cannot stretch out and be flexible to expand and accommodate more blood as it fills, as left ventricle fills, if that makes sense. So when it contracts with much force, because it's muscular, it can contract well, it just can't expand out well. It has a limited amount of blood that it could contract out. So in HCM, it's called diastolic heart failure. And the management is completely different than someone with systolic heart failure, which is why we have uh, COEs or centers of excellence because we know how best to treat a patient with diastolic heart failure and most other facilities know how to best treat systolic heart failure. So are the symptoms of heart similar. failure? Similar but not the same. So those with systolic heart failure, how do I say it? A lot of times those with systolic heart, I actually, you know what? I, I would think the symptoms are relatively the same. It's just a different mechanism. Okay. But you know, those with diastolic dysfunction do have an HCM, you have lumens of the arteries that are narrower than normal. So a lot of times patients with HCM do have chest pain at rest, which is not specific to those with systolic heart failure. So there are some mild differences with HCM uh, versus someone with systolic heart failure, if that makes sense. So I think I understand what you're saying. I'm going to clarify it a little bit more for some of our listeners. So people sometimes hear the term congestive heart failure. Correct. So let's talk about what's congestive heart failure versus heart failure in HCM. Well, <laughs> a little okay. yeah, you did. There's some caveats that make it different, and there's some similarities. Okay, so. Patients with systolic heart failure generally have lower extremity swelling, their feet swell. Patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy do not generally tend to have swelling in their legs and feet. They more have abdominal distension. They carry a lot of their fluid in their belly. They'll notice that their pants are not fitting as well, and they contribute that to, oh, I just gained a little bit of weight because, you know, I have HCM, I'm short of breath, and so I don't exercise as much as I would like, and I'm gaining weight. And that's not truly the case. A lot of times that's water weight versus a systolic heart failure is easy because I can't put my shoes on. These socks show an indentation in my leg. So it's easier to, 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 to identify systolic heart failure versus the heart failure specific for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Wouldn't you not agree, Matt? Yeah, I, I caught the end of it for sure. And, you know, uh, what I know for, for certain, and I'll add to that, is that uh, HCM is one of those there are lots of causes of heart failure, right? Certainly coronary artery disease is on the list. You can have non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and, and behave it with heart failure. You can have obstructive 
heart failure with it where there's clear, clearly SAM and obstruction, both of which have normal ejection fractions. And then you can have non-obstructive HCM where the, the EF is low, the, the classic HEFREF, <laughs> right? And um, all of those go into it. But what I know for sure is that HCM patients do not like being told they have heart failure. So they don't want to be lumped together. So uh, they don't, they, when they come to me and say, are you a heart failure expert? Because I, I don't want to be a heart failure patient. So I, we, we go through what heart failure is. And it's, in a, it's the inability for your pump to give you what you need in order to sustain a, a steadily increasing level of need up a flight of stairs, across the street, even up to you know, miles of running, right? So we have patients who can run who still have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with heart failure. And, and they're able to still do lots and lots of things that, that others without the, the diagnosis uh, can't do. So um, the congestive part of it is definitely, as, as Dietra mentioned, it's when you, when you fill up with fluid, when you're swollen and, and you're, you look like the Michelin tire man for those who, who are old enough to remember who the Michelin tire man is. My jokes are getting worse and worse as I get older. The, sometimes the residents look at me and they say, who? <laughs> so, uh, you exactly. know, the congestive part of it is the fluid, and that's an unusual need. We don't use a lot of diuretics in this group. We certainly do. It's part of the, the care. Lisa certainly was on some diuretics pre, but those are signs that I've, I've either missed the diagnosis or I'm in real trouble. So if I'm used, if you're needing Lasix at escalating doses, we're headed down a different path. And if we get there tonight, we'll talk more about it. We're going to try to. Okay. Uh, Matt, I'm going to have you share your screen again, and I'm going to stop on the questions for right now. Um, I will just say that to Barbara, I do agree with you that heart failure sounds doom and gloom and the end of story. Um, one of uh, the predecessors of the, uh, H, uh, the uh, Mars Memorial actually coined a phrase for their heart failure program, and they chose to call it heart success. Yes. So I like the optimism there. Um, your heart may not function properly, but we still can be successful. We have so many tools in the toolbox. We can keep pulling things out and somebody else asks, you know, is this doom and gloom or can I do okay? And most people with HCM do okay. They have to manage the symptoms or they have to manage their anatomy. And with a good team and careful management, most people can do really well for a long period of time. I had a conversation with one of my favorite people the other day. She's now 79 years old and, you know, she's slowing down a little bit and it's okay. What's, what's next? What's left in the toolbox for me? And good thing is we got about five or six things left in the toolbox there and she's 79. So that's a common scenario. So Matt, what are we talking about next? And what I'm going to have to do is where, where do we leave? Try to imaging in Okay. So we're going to go do imaging. So I'm going to have you talk everybody through some slides and explain this a little bit. And I'm going to shut up and go away for a while. So I, I, I you know, certainly uh, Dr. Marin and I are both trained in very similar ways. We are, we are non-invasive imagers. We, we live in the echo world and the MRI world. That's where both of us, I think, feel like we are super comfortable. And, and echo is the mainstay, all right? This is the primary modality that we make the initial evaluation for athletes and for, for patients with HCM and those who are at risk, right? So I'm showing you four different types of, um, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'm, I'm showing you on the left side of the screen, upper left is clearly massive hypertrophy. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with clear obstruction. Here's the mitral valve. And during systole or when the heart squeezes, that valve pushes over and touches on the septum. And you can see that bright area where that kind of over and over phenomenon leads to that kind of callus form right on side the inside of the muscle. And you can see the fluttering of the aortic valve as the blood tries to leave. So blood would enter from the lungs to the left atrium. Hopefully you can see my, my, my hand here, down through the mitral valve into the pumping chamber and then out to the heart. And what's obstructive is the valve. The valve is in the way, preventing blood from getting out. And at this heart rate, it's 63. And you also have, you already have obstruction when they go faster up a flight of stairs or down the, down the street, or they go chase the mailman, that heart rate goes to 70, 80, 90, 100. 
and that obstruction gets worse and worse and worse. And you see the same below that, where again, a very small cavity. This is massive hypertrophy. This is a young individual who ended up, uh, I believe, with a heart transplant. This is a very small cavity. There's just not a lot of space there for blood. So still obstructed, but the whole ventricle collapses. It's less the valve and, and more all of the, the squeeze. It doesn't fill well. There's not a lot of blood being pushed out and it doesn't ex eject blood. And then on the right side, you have two different types of obstructive. The right side of the screen on the top, you have apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in this case, without an aneurysm, where at the very top of the screen, that's where all the thickness is. And we talked about earlier, quote, missing the, the diagnosis. And part of it comes with this. If you're not looking specifically at the apex and spend some time making sure that you get a good look at the apex, you may measure the walls as totally normal here at the septum and at the base of the heart, but it's massively hypertrophy towards the apex. And one of the tip-offs is if you look at this echo going through, you can see that there's a P wave, a QRS up and down, and then the T wave is inverted, it's flipped. And when you see that inverted T wave, you've got to spend a whole bunch of time thinking about, worrying about, investigating the tip of the heart to, to look for apical HCM as, as a known ECG pattern for um, those with um, uh, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then below that is not obstructive HCM. So again, you'll see very thick septum, but there's no obstruction this time. This time the valve stays out of the way. It's not elongated and causing obstruction. But in this patient, the, the blood gets out without being obstructed. The valve is not in the way, but it's not ejecting in a, enough of, of blood. And in this case, uh, they're poor relaxers, right? It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't pull blood in easily and it, do, it has to push blood out. And that pushing phenomenon, that need for squeezing blood outward um, uh, is what leads to those heart failure symptoms, the breathlessness, the chest pressure, that pressure rises as you call for the heart to deliver more blood outward. It can't. It can't pull the blood in fast enough. It can't eject the blood out efficiently. And that leads to the symptoms of non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which often sound a lot like obstructive cardiomyopathy. So we talked earlier about stress echo, another type of echo where you're going to exercise somebody and then look at them right after you exercise. And Dr. Amon referred to this years ago, along with uh, uh, Dr. Nishimura talking about the search for obstruction. So if somebody has symptoms, what you want to do is look for that obstruction because that's a target. That's a target for therapy, for medical therapy. It's a target for surgical therapy and potentially alcohol ablation in that, in that, group, that group that you may refer for alcohol ablation. So <clears throat> looking for obstruction along with hypertrophy, looking for a mechanism for breathlessness is really an important part for the evaluation of HCM. But it all starts with echo. but MRI continues to grow, right? So I'm showing you the same types of patients, but now with MRI. And already I'm sure some of you are saying, man, those are clear images. Why aren't we doing that more often? And it's in, it, it, you can really see the value of MRI just by looking at it. So this is obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy here in the middle with not a lot of hypertrophy, but clearly obstruction here, the middle upper, showing that the blood is leaking into the left atrium, but also having trouble getting out of the heart. And then all the way to the left upper is a non-obstructive, massively hypertrophied septum, the middle of that heart, that gray part is very, very thick. And then all the way to the right upper is apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Those are typical um, types of MRIs that, that, that we do. And, and then down the bottom here, these are actually slides from a paper that Marty wrote. Um, you're, you're seeing there, the patterns of HCM are quite different. Even though they're, they're, they're all HCM, you can see a little basal knuckle here on the left side. You can see anterior only hypertrophy. And then this massive amount of uh, hypertrophy all the way on the end, all of which are better evaluated by MRI 
this is all without contrast. So the, there's no IV for this part. You don't need the contrast for this part. It's honestly a better quality, better contrast um, quality, meaning it, it gives you a better look at the muscle than does echo, but it's doing the same sort of thing. It's giving you a structure of what the, what the heart looks like. Now, if we go, if we switch and, and we remind ourselves of the power of MRI, this is where that power comes in. So the power is, is in the utility looking for LGE or what we, what we used to call um, uh, delayed enhancement. It has a variety of names, fibrosis and scar are often interchanged with the term LGE, but we know that the extent, the amount of late gadolinium enhancement is a strong predictor in HCM. It's very common in HCM. So just because you have scar doesn't mean um, that you are in the same category as everyone else with scar. But the more scar you have, the higher the risk for cardiac death events, progressing pro progression to um, weakening of the heart muscle and, and eventually a congestive part of heart failure that we talked about earlier. And then it also helps us look for apical aneurysms and apical um, scar tissue like you see here, all of which are part of the risk stratification, which is our next topic for sudden cardiac arrest. So imaging, it, it, they are truly complementary. So when you're wondering, do I need an MRI more? Do I need an echo more? Do I need a stress echo more? What's the role of TE? I think Marty and I would both agree that all of those are important. It just depends on the person in front of you, but that echo is the mainstay followed by MRI, those are the, the, the tools that you're gonna be going through more often really than any other testing. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to do math <clears throat> and let's bounce this back to the guidelines. Okay. What has changed in imaging in terms of the guidelines? So the majority, I think that the, I think the big shift that you should should be aware of. And, and one of the things that we talked about with, with the guidelines is that the next set of guidelines, unless there's been a complete change in, in what the data delivers, it's just an add-on to the prior. So there, there isn't a lot of shift from the 2011 to the 2020 guidelines in terms of its utility for ECHO. But what's, what's really, I think, come, in, come into play is the value of MRI. And it, uh, when, when Marty gets back on, I'm sure he and I can, can can banter a bit about the discussion in the room because that was a, a heated discussion and really kind of uh, reflected the difference in, in patterns um, and it, it, across the country. And I think the difference in, in how folks trained now, uh, the modern imager, the, the, the folks who trained in cardiology in the last decade, cardiac CT and cardiac MRI were not something you might do someday. It's something you do regularly. And it's a big part of how we evaluate folks. So I think the big shift in, in imaging for the guidelines was the, was the role of cardiac MRI, specifically of when to use it, how often to use it, when do you repeat it, and then the added value of late gadolinium enhancement, really important. Marty, you've done a lot of work in this area. I know he's not on camera, but he can unmute himself if he wants to just comment here right now. Um, there's been a lot of advances in cardiac MRI. We have HCMR. Many of the patients of the HCMA participated in that trial. What else do you think we have to learn from MRI going forward from here? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think probably small steps. I mean, I think we've learned a lot in terms of, of, of MRI's ability to add, as, as Matt was saying, to enhancing diagnosis, enhancing the overall characterization of, of, of an individual HCM patient's heart, how, exactly how thick it is, other areas of abnormalities. Um, and also, of course, as, as, as we've just underscored, the importance of MRI, the unique ability to identify scar, to predict better who is at risk of abnormal rhythms and <clears throat> so that's all good for MRI which is why as Matt said the guidelines have really emphasized the complementary and that's really the word we use complementary imaging tech uh, strategy with both echo and MRI you know almost all patients as part of the initial evaluation the future um, will be uh, you know 
advancing MRI techniques that may refine what I've just said in terms of you know, better, maybe slightly better ways or enhancing the predictive value of who's at risk using ensuring methods of MRI, which I, I'm not going to go into detail with because it's, 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 it's in the weeds with details. Other than to say, I think it will continue probably to add value by enhancing our predictive value of those patients that may be at risk for abnormal rhythms and heart failure symptoms. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna pause there for a second because some newer data came out about a month and a half or two months ago now that MRIs are safe for pretty much everybody with implantable devices, including extract or, um, abandoned leads. So there was study published on that. I don't know if you've seen it yet and what your thoughts are. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think there's more and more comfort with using MRI in patients that have devices, MRI compatible devices. Depends a little bit on the, on the center the, you know, that is doing the MRI, but there's an increasing comfort level and acceptance of, of doing MRIs reliably and safely in patients with MRI compatible devices. That said, I mean, I think the reality is that, you know, if a patient, patient has an ICD, the value of MRI, you know, in large part is diagnosis. So in that patient's diagnosis has already been made, of course, because they have an ICD. And in identifying those ACM patients that are the best candidates to have an ICD, and that question has already been answered there. So the value of an MRI in an ACM patient that already has a device, pretty low, pretty low, pretty low. However, Maybe so. the technology itself for other organs that might need to be imaged, it now opens that yeah. opportunity up. Right, that, that's exactly what I'm about to say. So for other indications for using MRI, outside the heart, yes, it could open that up. That's right. Yeah, so you know, we talk about how, how the ICD has really helped care for HCM. There's no question about that. It has been an enormous leap in right. safety for patients with HCM. And I think, I'm not sure, but I, I get the feeling that uh, there are some folks that may be concerned about getting an ICD because it limits their ability to get other testing. And I think that study, I was at Mayo, when we were doing uh, IC, we were doing pacemakers and ICDs safely with, with an effective protocol over 15 years ago. So for me, this is old news. And I know Marty's been doing this a long time too, that, that we know that this is, it, it's good to see some continued affirming data, um, but for other organs, it's important. And, and it's certainly safe if you need to do one for the heart, although I don't, I'm with Marty. I, I, it's pretty unusual for me to do that. And the other part that we forget is that it still gets in the way of the imaging. There's still artifact. I mean, there is a lot of artifact from the can, which is the device, that, the big part of the device that you can feel through the skin and from the leads itself. So although they may be able to get in the magnet, you may not be able to see very much once you're in there inside the chest. Now the shoulders and the head and the, and the legs, all totally safe. Uh, for the most part, um, I would still argue it really ought to be done in a center that has done many of these, that has protocols in place. If they're searching for the for the book with the protocol in it, ask for a different center. <laughs> Very right. wise. Okay, what do we have next up? Okay. Well, I think you're excited to talk about sudden cardiac arrest. And I thought it could have fell into this right after MRI. It's hard not to talk about it, right? So you, you asked this, this question in, in, um, uh, about what's changed in the guidelines. So you, I, I don't know if you knew this was coming or not, but again, an add-on to the 2011, but the progression to this set of guidelines has really been those three stars. And the, the utility for, for assessment of clinical risk factors for sudden death has gotten more and more robust, uh, you know, it seems like with every decade. And 
Um, I think we sometimes forget that. And, and Mar- I know Marty and I were on a meeting recently and he very, very poignantly pointed that out. We've come a long way. If you've been doing this long enough, you know that how far this has come and this is the next progression. And Marty, what I'm showing is uh, uh, the, the guidelines essentially themselves that, that we pulled out. And I, the risk factors for sudden death are, of course, family history of sudden death, massive hypertrophy, which we identify as over 30 millimeters or three centimeters, recognizing that not at 29 are you safe. And at 31, you are drastically in trouble. It's a continuum. There's a very big difference between 16, 18, 20, 23, and then 25 to 30, it gets a little, a little more subtle. And that's when we incorporate other things like, have they passed out? Did we have an arrhythmic sounding syncope? Did it sound like it was an abrupt exercise induced, scary kinds of passing out? Uh, do they have VT on their ambulatory monitor? Still some controversy about how ambulatory one must be and how long that monitor should be, 24, 48 or longer, how long is long enough. And this guideline didn't fully address that, but I think maybe the next iteration will have some more information. But the three new ones are uh, systolic dysfunction defined as an EF under 50. We know that that's a big risk factor in this condition, more so than in other conditions. LV apical aneurysm, and then extent of late gadolinium enhancement. And, and those are the big three. Those last three are, the, I think, the big changes from the prior. So for those of you who are seeing HCM centers, wherever you are, make sure that this discussion is occurring with, with you, that there's a change. And you may have these. And the, the degree of late gadolinium enhancement is, is really important. And I, I would... I think I'm uncomfortable not asking Marty to weigh in, uh, in on this. Uh, the LD apical aneurysm paper, I can very vividly remember Nishimura running into the fellow's room saying, this paper just got published. We need to address this. This is, this is, uh, <laughs> this is, a, this is a game changer. And then the extent of late gadolinium enhancement obviously is important. And Marty, you were a big part of both of those um, uh, evolutions. Yeah, no, I think you did a great job of summarizing, you know, <clears throat> the advancements in, in the risk markers since the last guidelines. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that, that the aneurysm and, and extensive scarring, which are primarily MRI-based risk markers, you know, that's, that's the thing, right? I mean, you can only get the scar information from the MRI. And, and you really most reliably identify the aneurysm patients with the MRI. It's much harder... I'd say much harder, but harder with, to, to identify it with echo. Um, and so, you know, I think that as we were just saying in the last segment, the, the risk stratification evolution story, uh, so important in being able to identify those patients at risk and who should be candidates then for primary prevention ICD devices has evolved to include the newer technology, MRI-based risk markers, um, which add substantially uh, to the, um, you know, to the sensitivity, the predictive value of the, of the risk stratification. And so um, I, I think, I think the committee all felt that this addition, these addition, the three additional new risk markers, you know, represented, uh, you know, a, another step forward in, in being able to provide protection against sudden death using this strategy better than what was available 10 years ago, for sure. So, um, Marty, do you remember the conversation in Dallas? Yeah. I think, I think the two of us looked at each other when they said, well, you only need it if the echo is inconclusive. And we yeah. said, yeah, the, the, the trouble is you only know it once you're done with the MRI. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly. I remember that very well. Um, <laughs> I think I was getting upset. That's why I remember it. Um, because I remember you know, we were, yeah, we were getting pushback for something that didn't didn't deserve pushback. But yes, I mean that's that's the that's the essence here. Why do you need an MRI as part of your initial evaluation? It's because you don't know what you don't see. And if you don't get the MRI, you won't know if you could have missed an aneurysm or a lot of scarring, because you sometimes don't get that be able to see that with the echo or can't see that with the echo. So that's exactly right. That's the basis for why 
almost all patients with HCM should have an MRI at least once. I'm going to turn this into rapid session because we could probably spend an hour on each of these topics, but I want to hit the top point on all the rest of the circle. But I will ask one follow-up question for Anders. Um, what actually is the mechanism that causes the left apical aneurysm? <laughs> Do we know what causes left apical <laughs> aneurysms? Is it because the heart's so thick and it keeps rubbing against each, itself inside the ventricle? What makes an aneurysm occur? So we, it's a great question. Um, the, the, the answer is that we don't actually know the definite steps that lead to an aneurysm forming. We can speculate a little bit you know, by putting a couple observations together. And if we do that, what, what one proposed sort of mechanism would be is that patients with aneurysms often have obstruction to blood flow out of the heart at the mid ventricular level, not from the mitral valve touching the septum, but from the mid part of the septum touching the other part of the heart. And, and that just is important because it probably creates high pressures in the apical part of the heart. And those high pressures probably are a stimulus for some susceptible patients to cause what we call micro, small, small little areas of damage, essentially, um, which turn into scarring and thinning of the muscle. That's, and, and then eventually the thick muscle turning into an aneurysm through that mechanism or process. Go ahead, Matt. Yep. No, I, I, I mean, I think I agree with everything. You know, it's a pressure problem, right? There's too much, there's, right. it's too thick. Uh, it, it becomes pressure, then it scars itself down. Then that scar becomes more pressurized and you get scar, but, but we don't really right. know. And, and I mean, even really what weight gadolinium enhancement is as a whole is still up for grabs, but the, I, I think it's a pressure problem as you allude to and, and that it outstrips some of the blood supply and, and it puts too much pressure on the wall. And, and that seems to be what happens, but I can't predict who's going to get one and who can't. So we got to look. We got to look. Okay, yeah, we're right entering now. speed and, round. And just, yep. I, I'm going to enter speed round because I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And the people who are listening saw this uh, circle, they want to know the answers. So I'm going to ask the questions this way Exercise and athletics. Did the guidelines document change anything in our comfort for people with HCM to live active? healthy lifestyles in terms of exercise and recreational athletics, where, where was the change? Marty, you want me to start or, or you want to start? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Matt. Yeah, so go ahead. I, I think I think what it did was it, it formalized the discussion, right? I, I think it's still mild to moderate exercise is the is the the descriptor that we do in the program and and everyone should do that it, that's really important that it, it it in no way said hey man you're totally safe off you go start to exercise don't talk to your doctor about it that's not what the guidelines were were talking about and what i would argue is that in centers of excellence th that discussion should be happening every year tell me what you're doing for exercise Tell me what you do. How safe do you do it? Do you go with a partner? Where do you exercise? Do you hydrate? Let's talk about nutrition, right? Because we know that it's hard to talk about wellness and, and, and exercise and lifestyle without at least talking about what you, what you consume. What's your BMI look like? How are you handling your weight? Because you're going to do worse if you're carrying more weight in virtually every condition. But HCM, is, is, it, it seems to be very important. And then I think what it also did was force the conversation to be, to be for, for those who say, look, I'm going to do more than that. It forces that discussion to be with an expert where it, one of the slides we have, which I don't know that we'll get to is, is that shared decision-making also has to look the clinician in the eye and say, are you the right person, man or woman, to be having this conversation with the person in front of you? 
it's not weak fish. It's not just let everybody exercise whatever the patient wants. It's a complicated, nuanced, individual discussion where both the patient and the the uh, physician have to be honest and they have to be upfront and they, and it is a risk stratification and you've got to decide if you're expert enough to have that conversation. And that's why I think it, Marty, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but I think that's why it landed as a two B where it, it, it really needs to be done in expert centers, not just, Hey, it's okay to exercise. Good luck. Marty. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah I think, I think you did a great job of, of, of sort of putting that together. I, I, I don't really have anything else to really add. I thought that that's right on the mark. And I think given the time, maybe we should keep going. I'm going to pivot it back to the shared decision-making because it's kind of at the top of the circle. But, you know, I'm going to argue that shared decision-making can only be effectual and, and accurate if both parties have an understanding of the data. And the physician is at a benefit because they're doctors or nurse practitioners or healthcare professionals that know the data. In most cases, patients don't. And I, I love the guidelines for this statement and I hate it as well because it makes me have to do a lot more work and my staff have to do a lot more work to help educate patients on how to ask questions. So you're gonna see us working on some programming to help advanced shared decision-making by helping educate through programs like this and others, the patients on what should they be asking? How do they know what's possible in a center when their community cardiologists only made certain things possible to them? So we have to really dive into what it means to make shared decision-making. And I'm hoping that our partners at AHA and ACC will assist us in that endeavor as well, because we all have to be playing with the same deck of cards and you know what the hands are. So, agreed? agreed. Disagreed? Okay. Agree, and I, I think um, I think there are three big items, right? I think that also goes for defibrillators. I think it also goes to surgery, right? Where the, and, and then of course, that's All decisions. Right? right? So, I, I think you have to decide if you're, and that's really where this great partnership can occur between cardiologists who are really good clinicians, but not experts in HCM, but can refer back and forth. And we've developed some really good relationships locally where they'll call me and, and it, it's a free consult, right? Hey, uh, you've seen this guy before. He wants to try this. Uh, is, is, two, is four beats of non-sustained VT enough for me to get excited? Do I need to put a defibrillator in this 68-year-old, 75-year-old? No, that's not enough for me, but I'm glad you called because that's part of the collaboration. And then that shared decision-making, I couldn't agree more. It has to be, it has to be experts on both sides. You have to educate and it takes time, man. It takes time. Sometimes it's two or three visits. Yeah. It's hard. It is. Risk assessment in children. Do we use the same risk factors in children or do we not use the same risk factors in children? We've lost right. already. Yeah, I started with this, and, and I think that the, the, the children portion of this was the pediatric cardiologist was a really welcomed addition to this discussion. And I guess what I'll say is that Z scores are just like very common in the pediatric world. They're really comfortable talking about Z scores, and I'm not. And I learned a lot during this process and have spent a lot of time understanding the Z score calculator because a 20 millimeter thick septum in an 11 year old is an entirely different discussion than a 20-year-old septum and a 40-year-old. And, and it's, I can't underscore that. And what I love uh, locally is we've got a bunch of good pediatric cardiologists who have my cell phone number and we talk a lot. And I, I ask about this and I ask about that. They refer folks over and we have a good collaboration with, with that. I think that risk assessment is not the same. And I think you've got to be mindful that for me, I lose more sleep over teenagers than I do anybody else. Yeah, they're, they're a difficult group. Um, we have taken a number of deep dives into atrial fibrillation in other big hearted warrior tour stops. So I will just ask the very simple question. Is there any major changes in the guidelines related to AFib management? I think the big one is Sotolol. And I think, uh, I think it's a new drug that for many years we thought of as you can't use it and left ventricular hypertrophy. And no surprise, this came out of a center of excellence 
uh, Mark Link and, um, and, and, and Marty when, when Mark was still there in, in Boston before he decided snow was no more fun and moved to Texas. He, um, you know, that, that, that sort of was the, the biggest change. And, and I think our, our individual appetites for moving towards catheter-based ablations is, is changing as well. We're learning more about atrial fib in this condition is really complicated and really hard to manage. I think the hardest to manage and I have very concrete shared decision-making discussions with folks and say, I'm really, I'm more aggressive than others. And I'm going to be upfront <laughs> that we, we need to have this discussion. You're 24. It's your second bout of atrial fib. I think it's time for something else. Yeah. So we will take deeper dives into that. And it's an ongoing topic. Um, and it ties into me yesterday, every day on the phone at the HCMA, we have the theme of the day. Yesterday it was people with persistent atrial fibrillation, some with obstruction, some without obstruction, and some without many other options left other than desperately trying to control AFib, but their left atriums are so dilated that's never going to be possible for them again. So what do we do with those people? Do we send them to advanced heart failure for evaluation is the question that I have right now that I'm gonna be hitting you guys all with. Uh, I think we might need to take another bite at that uh, transplant pathway guideline document. Um, but when do you bring in an advanced heart failure team? I think we underutilize the advanced heart failure team as a whole. And um, I have gotten more comfortable including them early on. If I'm in, if I'm, if you're not obstructive and I have, I'm running out of therapies, I, I, I engage them earlier. And, you know, we talked about research earlier and there's an ongoing study utilizing uh, Entresto. And I, I think um, I'm using it outside the trial as well, because I think it's got real value in, in, in some folks th 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 that I use it with my heart failure experts. And I think referral to a heart failure expert early when you're, when you're going down that pathway, when you can feel it. We have a great relationship with NYU that um, I, I'm very comfortable saying, I, I, I'm out of my wheelhouse. My, my ego can take it. I need your help. And, and, and of course, our, our own local group is, is phenomenal with, uh, with Abby Singh now taking the reins there. He has um, uh, been very, very well trained, has expertise in this. So getting them involved early on is, is really important. And then I'm how happy to say that my favorite heart failure doctor is back in practice at Mar not within the program at Morristown, but available to be seen in Morristown. So we have another person available now and I would encourage people to use him because he's brilliant. Yeah, um, and a good friend, super, super smart, a good friend. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so we know the Center of Excellence team matters. We know we're not gonna beat that horse today, but the guidelines finally agreed with it. Although not giving any credit to the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association for spending 25 years organizing it. Um, nothing like a political smack there if I could feel one. Um, however, uh, I appreciate that we are now collaborating on projects and moving forward in a positive and productive manner. And our voice and the voice of the patient is being very clearly heard at every level. Um, we have hit the 8.30 hour. That speed round went beautifully. Thank you so much. I am going to conclude our streaming on Facebook, but I will leave us open here in the Zoom room for just another few minutes in case there's any other follow-up questions that need to be asked. For those of you who joined us on Facebook, thank you for viewing. Stop by the website tomorrow for hcm.org and see our new face. Depending upon where you are in the country, it may take a little while to propagate, so you may not see it until Saturday or Sunday, but I assure you by Monday, you definitely will see a new website or, well, it might make the news, I don't know. Thank you so much, Facebook viewers, and goodbye.